help me understand if I have this right. You take over after they won a World Series. You're replacing a legend, okay? He leaves, and you are coaching a former teammate. Do I have that right? Yeah, you do. Um, you can add uh, Dave Duncan, uh, losing him as well that same year, one of the greatest pitching coaches in the history of the game. Um, there was a lot of transition. And, um, yeah, that was, a, uh, that was an interesting time for the St. Louis Cardinals organization, uh, our fan base. I often at times tell um, Cardinal fans, which I'll tell the ones in the room today, that I forgive them for what they were thinking when they appointed me. Um, <laughs> But uh, I completely get it. I, I do. I mean, it was a, uh, it was, it was a reach and uh, very grateful, obviously. Um, but th there was a lot there. And but fortunately, I was able to be a part of quite a bit of that and, and to spend time with Tony and to watch him closely, uh, to be involved with the, the 11 team and still doing some catching instruction. And um, you know, was one of uh, that teammates with Albert right when he came up into the game and, and watched that progression of, of being a guy that nobody knew his name to being the greatest player in the game at that particular time. And then um, having this young guy came, come in uh, named Yachty. And uh, the day I got hurt, I knew my days in St. Louis were numbered. Um, but just uh, even if I'd never had this, the job that I have, uh, to be a part, we were talking about culture earlier, to be a part of the culture of the St. Louis Cardinals and the, the history, the tradition, uh, the expectation, um, and then how it's just supposed to look a little different, how it's supposed to operate, um, priceless, um, but obviously helped as I was given this seat. Well, and as a GM, I, I like to ask coaches this question. As a GM, would you have hired you? Well, um, <laughs> It, it, was a, uh, it was a gutsy move. Um, I, would, I would think a number of uh, factors would have to go into that answer. Uh, seeing how they just came off a World Series, um, I would say if the team hadn't won yet, and, if that, and as a GM you've never won, uh, you, you're, you're really opening yourself up to a lot of scrutiny um, by making a bold move like this. But, you know, I applaud John Mozeliak uh, and, and Bill DeWitt all the time that uh, they, they took a chance and uh, they trusted their gut because it, it certainly wasn't common sense. And well, let me ask, so do, do you, was there ever a feeling of intimidation for having to follow Tony? Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to try not to go too uh, uh, theological here, but I, I, it made, it was so nonsensical that I got this job um, that I realized that I was here for a purpose that was beyond me and beyond um, even some of the decision makers. There were things that I needed to do to put myself in position to be considered. Um, but I just felt like it, it, I, I was here, put here for a reason and nothing was going to get in that way. Now, how long it lasts, you know, we, we still, none of us know. Um, but I, with that in mind, I, I always felt like, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this uh, and I'm going to try and do it right. And uh, I'm going to try and represent myself and my God and my family and this organization in a way of not necessarily trying to be a poor second-rate version of Tony LaRusa. Um, I want to be the best me that I can be and then try to em employ some of the, the um, really the, the selflessness, um, trying to, to, to figure out how to be a servant leader. Uh, inside a, a baseball locker room and, and try to impact lives the way you're seeing some of these other coaches who have legacies like a John Wooden, um, like, a, like a Tim Corbin, uh, people who are, are not just excelling on the field um, but are making a difference in, in the lives of young men. And so I committed that I'm going to go about this the way I think it should go, and uh, time will tell. Uh, it will be real obvious when it's time for me to go. Well, and and it's, this organization is such a visible organization and it opens yourself up to scrutiny. Hmm. How have you learned to deal with that? Um, I don't know, what'd you hear? Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, this, this was one point of uh, contradiction I had with Tony. Tony um, actually followed uh, everything that was written about him and uh, he kept on top of all the hot topics. Uh, I, I really believe that was probably before social media uh, completely got to the point where it is now. Um, so I followed his lead on that, and, and about the first week on the job, uh, there, I had a hit list, uh, pretty long, uh, pr quite a few people that I felt I, I needed to square some things up with. And I realized that this just isn't healthy, and it, it was against kind of who I knew I was, and 
Um, I, I agree that I need to be on top of what might be going on, but there were so many opinions coming from so many different directions. Um, Joe Torrey came in one time and I, I said, Joe, I said, you got to help me out with this, you know, playing in New York and talk about scrutiny. I said, uh, what's your thought on following some of the stuff that, that's being put out there? He said, are you crazy? He goes, I don't read any of it. He goes, you can't. He goes, I, I don't know how you could do it and keep your sanity. And I was like, thank you, Lord. That's exactly what I needed to hear. <laughs> and, and truly, I don't stick my head in the sand. I know what's going on. I mean, you can't help. Um, but to go out looking for it, for me, um, is just asking for trouble. And the way that I go about it, surround myself with uh, some very smart people that are not yes men and have a front office of incredibly intelligent people and, and have all them put their ear to the floor and let me know when we get something going in the direction that we need to fix. Up until that point, uh, I know what's going on in my clubhouse and I, I need to make sure that I understand that my job description is about figuring out how to serve my staff how to serve those guys in the clubhouse and, and lift them up and, and all the other people in our clubhouse that, that help. And how do I do that in a way that, that doesn't come back to me promoting me? And I, I think you could easily fall into that trap in, in this business, uh, any business, where you're constantly trying maybe to appeal to people on the outside and get away from what you really need to be doing and the people that you truly need to be investing into. Well, I work with a pretty high-profile coach, and, and he was telling me that, um, it's interesting, he had for sale signs in his yard. And he said it didn't bother him necessarily, but it created tension inside the house. So how do you manage your spouse and your kids if, if they're getting infiltrated with it? Yeah, um, I'll give you a quick story. We were um, <clears throat> up, up north in Chicago playing, and... Um, I was in the outfield shagging, and uh, some guy was out there wearing me out, and, and he yelled something I'll never forget. He yelled, uh, he goes, hey, Matheny, you even stink on my video game. And, um, and I said, you know what, I'm at least going to get as original, right? I mean, because I remember when video games come out, you're like, how cool would that be to actually be on a video game? So I go home that night, we had a day game, I get back home to St. Louis, and I'm sitting around the dinner table, and um, I tell my, my wife and kids this story. And I look over at my oldest, who's just a little guy. He was the only one old enough to pay attention to the story. Um, he, he has this look, and I'm thinking, you know what? This kid probably doesn't even understand why grown adults would come out and yell at other grown adults. That makes no sense, right? And so I, I put all this through, and I'm like, hey, buddy, don't worry. It's not that big a deal. You know, people do this. That's how they kind of have fun or been out or, you know, let off steam. And, and he goes, no, no. He goes, I've heard him yell at you before. He goes, I was just trying to figure out why, because you stink on my video game, too. <laughs> So um, they're, not, they're not immune to it. It's amazing. They, they, get, they, they hear the stuff that's out there, and I think it, it, it truly hurts them worse. I'm not, and I, I, I'm amazed if any coach would say that it doesn't affect them at all because it, you're human, and, uh, and, and part of me is a pleaser where I want to make every single fan that we have uh, truly just, just not, not necessarily love me, but love the product that we put on the field and, and appreciate the fact that we're trying to go about it the right way. But I think as we try and, and get everybody pleased, we end up uh, wasting our time and not investing, once again, properly into the people that we need to be investing into and into the product that we need to be investing into and then be able to walk away and say, listen, I covered the bases, I was prepared, I, I actually went about the, I made the decisions that I needed to make with the information that I had at that particular time. How can I improve on it next time? And then after that, we walk away. And when did you get to that point? Um, you know, work in progress still. So uh, I, I intentionally live uh, about 30 minutes away from the stadium. And so my routine is uh, I'll come off the field right after the game. I'll actually get about two and a half minutes before they tell me I have to be on TV. And so then I, I, uh, I put on this uh, apparently very grouchy face when I do this uh, post-game show, which I don't mean to. Uh, but, but I'm actually, I'm in, I'm in defense mode at that point. I'm trying to figure out how can I not say something that's going to hurt my club? How am I going to say something that's not going to do something to one of my players? Or I say it in a way, even joking. And, and if I don't stay on point, I know I'm going to make a mistake. That's going to embarrass myself in our club, and, and once again, if, if I say something that fractures that, that chemistry we have in our clubhouse, then shame on me. So I have to sacrifice the fact that I, I look uh, very uh, uh, crotchety. Um, but uh, I, I take that time after those questions, and I get together with some of my staff, and we, and we unpack the game. 
We go through the things that we need to fix. We start to prepare for the next day, and then I have 30 minutes I have in the car by myself um, that I make the transition from being a manager of the St. Louis Cardinals to being a husband and a dad. And I, I, I try to be very intentional about um, making sure that my family knows that this position is what I do, it's not who I am. And um, I get that right sometimes, uh, and other times I, I do a good job of faking it. Well, what's the, what's the biggest struggle with separating what you do from who you are for you? Yeah, I think uh, just like anybody else, and people that are drawn to excellence, uh, there isn't necessarily a clock that you punch. And um, so it's, it's being fully present. And I think that's the greatest gift that I can give, whether it is to my wife or to my kids, that when I am there, it might not be uh, the quantity that I would like had I had another position, but that I am truly present, that I am in the moment. Uh, I'm not thinking about the, the, next, the lineup for the next day while my wife's kind of unloading some things on me or, or I'm talking to my kids about what's going on with them. They can tell. Uh, these kids are sharp. They're, they're smart. They know whether or not I'm giving them lip service and I'm just passing time or if I'm truly engaged in their life. So uh, to me, I, I, I've been given a gift, I believe, that I can, and I think it's just taken some time. I did it as a player, too. Uh, we go do whatever it is they want to do, and, and I force myself uh, sometimes not to go where I want to think about the game and um, focus just on them. And do you draw a lot of peace of mind from your routine? Yeah, I, I think we all understand uh, no matter what level you coach, uh, you have to have some consistencies. And you know, I've, I'm fortunate to have an incredible staff that I'm not afraid to delegate responsibility to. Um, and you know, I get this question a lot about just defining what my job is. My job uh, is truly, um, I would say, 90% people and 10% baseball. And so when I show up, I, they talk about open door policy. My door's only been closed a couple times, and that's because we had big stuff going on that some people couldn't hear. But for the most part, uh, I want to have that conversation back and forth. I need to be present. I need to be at the field to understand where the guys are. I need to understand some of the issues that we have. Try to head some things off at the pass. And uh, the baseball stuff we'll have covered. We, we, we love to do that. We love to dive in, figure out how we can create an edge. Uh, but the rest of the stuff, you, you have to be present to, uh, to figure out where the people are and where the, the, the team is heading as a group.